um, hope everybody's doing safe um, and staying healthy. And um, I'd like to thank the Ilus Diamond Society for um, letting me help in my way. Um, I just finished my PhD and I have a lot of things to thank patients for, for uh, let me, um, let, that, that they let me test them and also uh, teach me a lot about Ilus Diamond. And today my webinar will focus actually not on, it's not going to give you the answer that what you should do. Um, I hope I will teach you how to start to figure out yourself a way, a system that you can stay active in these very strange times with COVID and the lack of healthcare at this point, uh, of physical healthcare as you normally would you be used to. So um, before um, we're really going to start, I want to give a short introduction of myself. Well, I'm Mark Scheper. I'm a physical therapist and a clinical movement scientist. Um, currently, I'm working on a project going growing up with chronic diseases in urban environments. So where I focus on uh, what happens with children when they grow up with a, with a disability or an illness and uh, with a special attention for rare pediatric diseases and hereditary diseases of connective tissue. So it just handles is still something where I have sold my heart to and will continue to work on. Um, I work as an associate professor in physical therapy in the Netherlands and in Australia uh, at the University of Applied Sciences Rotterdam in the Institute for Health Innovation and also at Macquarie University, the Faculty of Medicine and Health in Sydney, Australia. And uh, with the other stuff I do, I'm also a member of the physical therapy working group for the EDS consortium. Okay, so um, just in December, I finished my PhD. And uh, my, I, well, my PhD was focused on hypermobility syndrome and Edith Daniels hypermobility type, unraveling the concept of disability during childhood. And I'm not solely a researcher that focuses on children. I also do a lot of clinical work uh, and research in adults as well, and also in uh, athletes with hypermobility. And um, the research I'm using in this webinar is part of where my thesis was based on, but also it's going to be about my clinical experience as a physical therapist and also the, the tricks, the, the things I've learned with talking to patients. And I want to tell everybody actually that um, there are a lot of people out there that are actually doing awesome things and we can learn a lot about them, not just as a scientist, but also as a clinician. So with these tricks, I want to tell you today. So um, what are my learning objectives? Of course, I'm a, I'm a lecturer, so I have learning objectives also for you. And um, the first one is what are the mechanisms that underlie disability? In individuals diagnosed with ELS Thanos, and also I think with hypermobility spectrum disorders, you can use these, uh, these principles as well. Um, also, um, you notice that I have put uh, disability between the uh, books, and um, I don't want to focus on also on the negative side of having ELS Thanos, but also want to look at the opportunities you have, and also the opportunities you have at this point with the COVID uh, outbreak. Uh, so it's and want, uh, what I want also you to, that you try to look at opportunities instead of the threats, which is in these times really easy to do because there's a lot of things going wrong in the world at this point. Um, second part is what are the potential factors that can be targeted for self-interventions? So um, this webinar will not give you, uh, tell you what you should do exactly, but more it will focus on how you could do it. And second is um, how you can tailor it yourself to your own talents, to your own uh, abilities. And one of the main things I've learned with working with ES Daniels patients and also with generally with hypermobility related disorders, no patient is alike. And everybody has his own problems, but also their own talents. And I want you to learn how to use those talents. And the last part is how to take advantage of your environment. So uh, my research at this point focuses also on what does the environment do for a child and an adult with a chronic disease. But what we also learn is that the environment can help you, can enable you uh, to do certain stuff. Only the problem is at this point is you have to really look hard to find these uh, options. So we're going to focus a little bit on that at the end. So let's go at the first part. Uh, the first part will be on the mechanisms of disability in either standard. And before um, we start talking about how does Ilos Danos work in terms of disability? Um, just want to put out there, uh, what is disability and what I find is disability, the, the, the definitions that I use. I use the International Classification of Functioning in Youth. Also, this is the same for adults. And um, I don't want to be too sciencey, but 
you, some things I have to be very uh, explicit out of what do I uh, mean by disability. And when looking at disability in, in terms of well, English language, for instance, is everything that is bad with your health status. So the pain, fatigue, uh, the ability for you to walk the stairs or the inability to do it, et cetera, et cetera. And um, for me as a physical therapist, I'm also interested in the symptoms that people have, but my main focus of my treatment is on a functional level. So the activities, the things you can do, so you can walk up the stairs or walk uh, through your garden or whatever, but also how you can participate um, in your own environment. So are you able to work? Are you able to attend to your children? Those kind of things. And this is, will be my focus. So it will be my focus on the activities and the participations because I'm a physical therapist and this is actually the thing that I want to help you with. So the other part is environmental factors. So uh, you can imagine that if you have, uh, are able to walk up the stairs, um, that the type of stairs also do matter. So you have like a curly stairs, it can be a little bit more difficult than we have just straight stairs like I have in my home. Or sometimes you have like a, a home that is adapted, so you have no stable services or whatever. Um, those environmental factors can also be like positive, but also sometimes negative. And uh, the problem is at this point, um, being confined to your environment, you know the environment pretty well, but it has its limitations. And um, one of the things that you can do is not, well, I'm not gonna say go decorate your house at this point, um, but look for the options that you have. Okay, so let's start with first a little bit with the science. See, so don't focus too much on the graphs, they're just an illustration. And this is one of my papers um, that focused on the, uh, well, the growth of disability over time in children and young adults with ehlers danlos And in general, we found that we have actually like three types of trajectories for disability. So one of them is actually quite stable in the green lines where children and adults actually do pretty good and are able to maintain that level. There are also people that, that have a little bit ups and downs. So we call it a little bit of moderate or recurrent trajectory. So sometimes people are uh, uh, experiencing some disability, so they can't walk up the stairs again. And a week later, with they did some tricks or they had a brilliant physical therapist, of course, um, and they were able to walk upstairs again. And this is like the way life continues a bit. And there's also one group, and unfortunately, um, we know those people that are there and they have a progressive disability. So disability becomes worse over time, especially when growing up. And these people have a lot of problems in walking distance, loss of activity levels, and quality of life is well, pretty bad if you look at the third panel. Um, but the upside is, it means that like, if you look at the, the dispersion of the number of people with the black and the red uh, that have an, a, or the red and the green, sorry, uh, that have a stable or recurrent form of either's downloss, it's 66%. So it doesn't mean that these people don't have symptoms, that they don't experience a lot of pain or fatigue or whatever. They still manage to keep a functional level. And in general, uh, these people tend to do pretty okay but it takes a lot of work. And what I want to explain you a little bit is how do you can get in that 66% or stay in those 66% and how did you, if you are 33% that have a progressive form of disability, how can you stabilize it as much as you can? And the things I'm now going to tell you is just of clinical observation with patients. Let's talk about pain and fatigue. So when I started my PhD, I thought it was really straight. And of course, like any PhD student, um, I was going to solve this problem. Um, unfortunately, just got more questions, but I learned a lot. And one of the first things I thought was a problem was the pain and fatigue. And you have two graphs here. This is the pain and fatigue the, uh, um, evaluation over three years for every single patient. And when I saw first these graphs, well, my world fell apart because there goes my theory. So pain and fatigue are all over the place. So there's no single pattern in pain and fatigue. And when talking to patients, um, of course, people have a lot of pain, but um, how people 
handle pain or experience pain is quite different and for fatigue even more. So what I've learned here from is that pain and fatigue are actually not a really good outcome measure to rely on. Uh, it is not like uh, when you have more pain that you have to do less because you can't, are not able to do, um, the relationships between pain and function become obscured, especially in chronic diseases, but especially in illus danos, and also fatigue. Uh, fatigue is still one of the most disabling complaints, that's true, um, but um, it doesn't mean that you become less functional if your fatigue increases. Sometimes it does, sometimes it don't. So when thinking of your own health and thinking of the time you're now spending at home, uh, of course, um, your pain development or fatigue development are actually not really good um, anchors to focus on. They're basically all over the place and they can change with minimum provocation or sometimes when you have like a major luxation, the pain and fatigue doesn't change. So sometimes it's not like really straightforward how you look at it. So on the basis of a lot of data, but this data, we made a model. And this model is actually a, uh, a new version of a Castori's model. Uh, Marco had a brilliant first model, um, but as he said, it's still a little bit rough and I tried to refine it in my own way, but focusing on disability. Oh, sorry, a little bit too fast. So um, what you should learn from this model that you have the three groups of disability. So you have people with a normal variability, recurring disability and a progressive disability. And um, you can transition between these types of disability. So you can even transition back to a normal variability. How do you do it? I don't know, but I know that people are able to do this. There are not a lot, but some do. Most people that have actually a really good rehabilitation um, program actually come to the recurring disability part. So they're able to stabilize their own disability and able to manage the, the development of the, the disease itself. And there are some uh, indicators that can that make people transgress from like the normal variability to the recurrent variability or whatever. I'm going to explain in brief what these transitions may look like. So we talked a little bit about disability. So you should understand now that there are like different types of disability and different progressions of disability. And it can change in the course of a lifetime. So in children, we see that sometimes children stay stable and then develop a progressive disability when they're adults, but also some of them stay in recurrent and actually are able. And like the most people, 66% 6, 6, 6 of the data I saw um, was actually basically, um, yeah, people that are doing pretty well, um, well, they were able to manage. So I'm not saying they're not sick or whatever, um, I'm saying that actually they are superheroes. So let's go back to the model again. And um, first things, what are what is the first problem you become with looking with Ehlers Danlos is the hypermobility. So um, what I thought when I first started is that the hypermobility is one of the issues and one of the problems. And I did a study in uh, professional dancers, and indeed I found if you have like hypermobile joints. Um, that you are more susceptible to pain, fatigue, and even uh, psychological issues. Um, however, when I started looking at these uh, relationships um, in normal people that were not professional dancers or in patients, um, I couldn't find these anymore. So um, that's the second bubble that was popped on me. Is like pain and fatigue is not really a good um, way to look at stuff. Um, hypermobility is not as well. Um, Actually, it's something you have and it defines you and, and recognize the disease, but on itself, it's not really a good uh, indicator that you have a, a progressive or recurrent disability. So um, what, 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 is, what are the differences? So when we look at generalized joint hypermobility, we look at a joint uh, range of motion. So you can uh, bring your joints far further than normal. And you have also a little bit of joint instability. So some people have uh, highly flexible joints and the joints can become stability. 
And the old idea was, is that when you have a, a big a, a range of joint motion, um, you will have, or more susceptible to pain. So what I found in professional dancers, uh, you have more fatigue and more disability. So you I will probably have problems walking up the stairs or climbing down anything else, or tending to your kids or whatever. Um, and then what I just told you, actually, I didn't find these relationships with range of joint motion. Um, but what I did find is actually, it is not the joint motion that is the problem. It's the way you can control your joints. So your joint stability or joint instability actually leads to more pain, more fatigue and disability. Um, and this is one of the critical parts that you can't say uh, if somebody has really highly flexible joints, you will have a lot of problems. But if you have highly flexible joints and you're not able to control them, then it will become a problem. And this is actually also why I have called the topic, my topic juggling your health on a trampoline and a ball, because I think it's part of the um, an anagram for the problems you are faced when you have Ilus Danos, but also it's probably part of the solution. So um, when looking at joint instability, um, I did a, a study in the children and adults and also looked at the literature. And um, actually, joint instability is actually more clearly uh, associated with pain, fatigue, also decreased walking distance, reduced quality of life, and also um, uh, reduced muscle strength, or, and this is a bit of a discussion, the ability to generate adequate muscle strength. So some people have pretty good muscle strength, but when, we, when they want to use it in a functional way, they can't, the timing is off or whatever. And when looking at generalized hypermobility, well, it's a clinical feature, but it is not associated with the severity of your complaints, nor is it associated with the severity of your disability. Well, I couldn't find it in my data. And basically, when looking at the experience I have in professional dancers, they have pretty hypermobile joints. They're actually Olympic level athletes. And these people um, are, well, they're beautiful to watch it, but they're also fantastically, uh, fantastic athletes. Um, but the only way when you have generalized hypermobility, when it becomes a problem, is when you are doing it at a high level or that you start exceeding the normal cap cap capabilities of your body. And when you have hypermobility, when you have hypermobility and you're looking at athlete level uh, activities, that's the part where you probably are a little bit more vulnerable than others. So instead of focusing on hypermobility, you should focus more on your joint stability. But there's also something else. So basically, if you are, have a good physical fitness, um, you are active, um, you're able to stay in a normal variability group. So you have uh, a normal way of life. It could be that you still have pain and fatigue. Uh, again, um, it is something you still might have or all the other symptoms you might experience. But uh, it is not that you have a, a problem with um, uh, the functional part. But there's also something else. Um, in my work, I found actually, uh, well, actually I was triggered by patients that they were really, really sensitive. And uh, when just talking on a friendly basis with people, I, the, a lot of people told me that they have um, a lot of problem with textures in food, um, that they tickle easily, like children tickle really easily uh, with Ilus Um but also um, that they often experience pain when they shouldn't, that's what they say. And I, I was really triggered about that because, um, is, well, I didn't, I didn't find these people hysterical, not at all, actually they were quite, rational people. Um, and uh, again, there were a lot of psychological comorbidity. Still, um, it was quite consistent. So what we actually did is, oh, I'm going too, uh, too fast. What we actually did is starting to look at the central nervous system to see how it does function. And what we actually found is that when you have a central nervous system um, that is well, highly sensitive, these people start accumulating musculoskeletal issues, pain, fatigue. Again, it becomes more erratic, um, but also the disability becomes worse. So probably the difference 
what I think at this point, and this is speculative, between hypermobility and pathological form of hypermobility is that your sensory nerve system is highly sensitive. And when it becomes sensitive, you become you have uh, probably have a recurrent disability. So what? How do we find it out? Uh, basically, we looked at pain thresholds, and we started well pushing at certain points and asking children and adults uh, when does it become annoying the pain when when it becomes painful, and that moment was our cutoff point. And uh, at the places where people uh, experience pain, well, the pain pressure threshold was lower. But when we started pushing at other places where the people did not report pain for at least a month, um, they didn't actually have the similar thresholds. And um, these, what we found out is actually that the pain thresholds are generalized lower. And um, when looking at other symptoms, so with the graph uh, below here, you have like uh, the, the, these are the pain thresholds compared to other diseases. So like chronic fatigue syndrome, for instance, is quite similar, but looking at things like pelvic pain, osteoarthritis, low back pain or migraines, uh, even something like migraines, uh, the pain threshold is really low. So uh, when looking at the central nervous system, um, it's really sensitive in either Daniels. And probably in, in uh, I don't know about uh, hypermobility spectrum disorders, but I'm guessing it's a bit similar. But um, there's also something else. So if you have lower pain thresholds, um, you probably experience pain sooner than others. And again, this is not something you're imagining. The pain you feel is real. It is there. Why is it real? Because you feel it. Yeah. And uh, the problem is with uh, the central nervous system that is actually hypersensitive, it starts triggering, start more triggering earlier than it would normally should. And um, in Ehlers Danlos, um, it's probably the way why people react really uh, early to pain. And we also found that these pain thresholds are also uh, associated with increased levels of fatigue. Even more so, um, at this point, we can actually pretty good predict on the basis of the pain thresholds, uh, what will be your uh, the progression in symptoms? And people with a uh, hypersensitive central nervous system have uh, escalating pain, but also escalating fatigue. But there are also other studies that actually found that a central nervous system that's highly sensitive is also related with anxiety. Um, there are studies in adults that prove that the brain, when it's more sensitive, that you are more anxious. And also what we found is that the quality of life is also severely reduced. So that centralized, that sensitive nervous system, your brain, um, is more finely tuned than other brains. And also things, why it is so hard to look at pain as a measure for your ability to do stuff um, is because your brain is on full sensitivity and things that like for me, for instance, I don't have either stand loss. So when I, have, we, we could both have the same experience, right? So uh, you stretch my leg uh, unexpectedly, and uh, even though my leg is not hypermobile and the same leg in your case, for instance, is not hypermobile as well, the chances are that you will react with pain than I would. And that is not because I think you're imagining stuff, it's because your brain is more sensitive than mine. So when you have a sensitive brain, you probably will have more musculoskeletal issues and you have more problems with uh, retaining functional ability. When you start having symptoms with your connective tissues, uh, your um, internal organs, actually, we found actually that multisystemic involvement is actually the most, most confident predictor we have for a progressive disability. So we found that Multisystemic issues are a big problem. POTS is a big, a pretty good predictor for uh, progressive disability, but also psychological comorbidity, specific anxiety and depression. And this is not unique for Ilus Danos. This is actually for most chronic diseases. When you start having psychological comorbidity, you start becoming inactive. And when you look at the whole part, the whole model, you probably will see that, well, deconditioning and inactivity um, 
is one of the is basically your biggest enemy. And uh, living in confined quarters at this point, or not having uh, the usual healthcare you normally have, uh, is probably now a bigger problem than ever. And when systemic issues and your mental health start deteriorating, you're more likely to come to the progressive part of the disability. And decommissioning and inactivity is actually one of the biggest more reasons why people stay uh, have disabilities. Also, when you have um, when you start being anxious, your brain is also highly sensitive. Um, life starts building up with all sorts of problems. You become limited to your own confines. Um, cognition comes into play. So you can have fearful things. When you're not able to cope or you can't find a way to do it properly, um, I think it's pretty healthy that you get maladaptive cognitions. Um, and over and under activity uh, will follow up. And especially the last two are really important. Um, to monitor in these times. And especially um, underactivity is a big problem at this point. So systemic involvement, I just brought through it. These are the ones that I found in, in children and also in adults, skin issues, incontinence, obstipation, diarrhea, and blood pressure issues. These are the ones that actually, the most systemic issues that you should be aware of. Um, when these start to progress, please consult your GP you can consult them uh, from a distance. Um, these are something you have to be wary of uh, when it starts progressing. If you can manage them, it's fine. Also, depression and anxiety are something you have to monitor as well. Um, it is more than normal that you all have sad feelings and you have anxious feelings, especially now where you can't, you're being with your loved ones, but also you can't be with your parents or other people uh, you want to be with. Uh, so even I, can experience some depression, anxiety at this point. Um, but when you have chronic disease, it's probably even worse. The other factors, it's something that just really has to be thought of is overweight. Um, what I found in all the people uh, would I talked to that had really severe problems that were not able to cope as much, um, get overweight. And people, uh, I even found some children, uh, what it, this is a clinical observation. I had some children with underweight, and they had less um, less problems in the in the joints at this point. Um, and actually, it's pretty logical. So I'm not saying please get underweight uh, because it has all older difficulties. Um, but maintaining your weight or not at least trying to keep it stable is something really important at this point. And also trying to uh, make sure you don't develop muscle weakness. So muscle weakness is something that's really common. A lot of people uh, complain about it, and um, often it is easy to train. Um, and this is also the thing that we're using as physical therapies, uh, physical therapists a lot to make you uh, try to reduce your disability. But um, this is also the part where a lot of things go wrong. And the rest of the PowerPoint will focus on how you can do it properly yourself. So. How can you self tailor your interventions? And how can you do it on your own talent? And this is something that I want to share with you. This is a study of mine on the effectiveness of, um, of physical therapy and combined with the cognitive interventions, all different kind of things. And I want you to focus on graph A. So actually being active and being able is pretty effective in pain reduction. So this is something we know, but if you look at the wide of the effect, um, it's very variable between people. And I think the variability comes from um, that people um, often start training and uh, they learn how to train, but they don't learn how to tailor the training to that point. So what is difficult in English Danos, also for me as a physical therapist, is that the disease can change quickly and a lot. And, um, you are not able as a physical therapist to see every training somebody does. You want to try it, but well, in our healthcare system in Netherlands, you have a certain amount of sessions and you have to try to help somebody within those sessions. Um, and uh, so it's not possible to 
every time be there for the patient. So people, what I try to learn people is how to um, learn to cope with training themselves and how they can, um, first of all, uh, recognize, okay, I'm doing too less or too much. And second of all, is how to do something and keep doing it. So this is, I think, the most important thing I want to tell you and teach you. Um, overtraining versus undertraining. So one of your main challenges at this point is staying active, right? And um, what I always want is that people do something that they like doing. So um, it should be fun. You should, do, you should be able to do it frequently and you should do it properly with the right training intensity. And um, you should know that actually that overtraining is often looked at patients as really dangerous. Um, undertraining is, in my personal opinion, and there's no science behind this statement, is that undertraining is probably even more dangerous um, because both of them can be really disabling and can have severe, severe long-term effects. But the problem is with undertraining is that you don't directly feel or know that you're doing too less and that your body is not actually getting the proper dosage of exercise to start adapting. Um, uh, the guidance from a knowledgeable professional, a physiotherapist or exercise therapist, or whatever, is crucial, but on its own is not enough. You have to learn yourself how to respond to your own version of Ilus Danos, how your disease will modulate itself and how you can react to it. Um, even for me, the progression of symptoms is so hard to predict um, because of it's not, it's connected to diseases. So everything in your body is connected tissue. So all the symptoms are connected to each other. So when you have more diarrhea, people have more pain. Uh, sometimes when people have a lot of pain, they start also developing a lot of fatigue. Fatigue and thoughts are really related to each other. And I can have a list of things that are related to each other. And this makes for an outsider, a physical therapist like me, is really hard to predict. On the other hand, you as a person have the information of your body. And one of the problems you have is that it is really hard to interpret it. How, what are these things? What do they mean for me? And how can I tackle this? And I think that self-management is key in this instance. So you can train all you want, but no training will fit all the time. And there is no, nothing like a one size fits all treatment for any patient with a chronic disease, especially Ilus Danos. So you have to learn yourself how to adapt your training, but also how to take advantage of the opportunities of that day. So when you have a good day, go for it. When you have a bad day, don't worry too much. You probably will have a good day soon enough. But if it starts progression, you will have keep having you will having uh, have bad days all the time. Then you need help. So, how can you tailor it? Well, the traditional uh, view in training is that training intensity is really important. So, when you have a adequate training intensity, you will reach a certain physiological threshold, right? And this is the the the, the signal of the to the human body, okay, you have to adapt because I'm doing stuff uh, which I'm not able to do at this point. So you start to have to develop muscle mass or start creating more stamina and those kind of things. This is what we call a physio physiological threshold. And what we know from exercise uh, physiology, that there are certain limits you have to do in order to get an effective training. So we know that there are certain thresholds you have to reach, but also you have to have certain times you have to keep doing it. So one of the traditional views is for, for, for instance, uh, repetition and load. So how many repetitions can you do with a certain load? And there's when, uh, for instance, this is one of the ways to do it. Uh, a lot of physical therapies use for strength training 10 to 15 repetitions at 60 to 80% of one repetition maximum. So that's the maximum load you can do. Well, there are two problems with this. One of the thing is that uh, 10 to 15, sometimes it's a lot, sometimes it's too less. But also one repetition maximum is hard to test when you have Ilus Danos. Uh, it's also quite scary. If you have a lot of pain, then somebody asks you, okay, let's 
lift a, a, a humongous weight and hopefully it will work. Um, and the other part is that the disease fluctuates a lot, even per day. So just looking at this physiological threshold, it's not always able for you to reach it. Second, <coughs> sorry, it's the emotion, sorry. Um, you have to do three to five sets, right? So every time you have to do it, and what is one of the rules? You have to stop at muscle failure. So when you're not able to do the repetition. So remember all those movies when you have like big bodybuilders like Arnold Schwarzenegger and he has like the last repetition, his face goes all blowy and those kind of things. He starts doing the strange stuff. Um, this is the part um, when you're at your muscle failure. And um, for some patients, this works perfectly. Yeah. So if you're one of those people, perfect. Do it. This is your assignment. Um, and if you do it properly, you'll get more muscle mass. And muscle mass has a lot of uh, um, advantages besides it looks pretty good, uh, which is also still important. You have to get outside one of these days. Um, the other part is that you will have, if you have more muscle mass, it's easier to walk up the stairs, right? It's more easy. Um, people with more muscle mass have less fatigue. Uh, muscle weakness is actually associated with more fatigue and also with pain. And well, I can't see it because I'm in there. And when you have that muscle mass, you increase your muscle mass, life is a little bit better. But in Ilus Damos, I think it's a little bit different. And this is the trick I want to teach you. So again, your physiological threshold, you're a human being like, just like the rest of us, um, and you still have to reach your physiological threshold. And Still, repetition and load is important. I would suggest if you start doing strength training, eight to 10 repetitions at a large, uh, um, for your own level, a large load um, is fine. So a lot of people are thinking like more repetitions is better because I have a less load and I can stabilize it more. But one of the problems is that when you're doing things for a long time, you have uh, you have more chance of be becoming instable and when you become more fatigued, the instability increases in your joints. So it's better probably to do less repetitions and don't, don't stop only at muscle failure, but also at stability failure. So what do I mean by that? The movement you're doing has to be controlled from beginning to the end. If you can't control it, then you're not training at the proper load. You have to do it less. And when you should increase your load is when you can control the movement. So for instance, like with a squat, if you stand up and you do a squat and you're not able to control it for at least at eight repetitions, you have to do it differently. So what you should do is then downgrade a little bit. So instead of uh, doing it standing up, lay down on your back and ask your children or your partner to be the weight and start pushing them away like a leg press, right? Use your creativity. But only you can you progress is when you can keep it stable. And then the second part starts when muscle failure starts uh, occurring. So what does it mean that you start with really, okay, I'm becoming more um, cramps or not at least like you had did a lot, right? So you become fatigued in your legs or your bicep, the muscle group you're doing. And I would also suggest that try to do it with weight bearing. That's the most easiest way to do. But there is also something else. So when you have certain load and you're able to do it pretty good, so if you don't have like fatigue between eight to 10 reps, you're probably doing it too light. And again, under training is a big adversary. So you have to watch for that. So if you're able to control the movement and you're at eight to 10 reps and you can go, I can do 20 more, you're training too low, so you do it more. There's also something else. So again, you should look at three to five sets. That's, I think it's perfectly if you do it like that, but in the first set, it's pretty good if you get eight, at eight to 10 reps. But in the second and the third, don't force it going to those eight reps. Again, stability failure is more important, but also muscle failure. If muscle failure, if you're still stable and muscle failure, uh, starts building up at rep five, stop at rep five. Don't push it. 
but if it feels right, then you can push it. You can make it a little bit more difficult. So your first criteria, stability and control, you should do it moving, the movement should be controlled and stable, and you have to stop when the movement control deteriorates. And sometimes you can't see it yourself, so it always helps doing it with something, somebody doing strength training with a friend or a child. And second criteria is when you have muscle failure, then you can increase the load. And if you do it really on a conscious way, you will get the physiological threshold and you keep doing it for at least six weeks, you will have advantages in muscle strength. But also when looking at activity, I'm looking at my watch, I'm going a little bit faster. Um, you should do have like 60 minutes, 60 to 90 minutes a day for habitual structural activity, right? So if you have like 60 minutes of groceries or cleaning the house or whatever, it's fine. 60, 90 minutes, aim for it over a day. And it doesn't have to be like continuous, just try to be active. Um, in your own confines, uh, it's hard to stay active, especially if you have a small house like I do. So um, you have to probably try to keep your normal activity level a little bit higher than you should be, should do. It's probably going to be a little bit more difficult anyways. Um, so if you have a smartphone, look at the steps a day and try to maintain the level of steps at least. But you also have training. So uh, what I would suggest is you try to do 60 minutes, three times a week of training. And what's the difference between habitual and structural activity and training is habitual and structural activity is functional. So this is doing your stuff normally to live and training is to get better to have more stamina. So um, how can you tailor that intensity? Basically, sweat on your back. So if you are doing exercise, and you start sweating and you're not scared, uh, or it's not like you're living in Las Vegas in the desert uh, and you sweat easy, you have to have a decent amount of sweat. It will help. Um, but also, it should be stable, right? Stability, again, is really important. So um, walking on a treadmill is fine if it's intensive enough. Running on a treadmill is also fine if you can keep it stable. So sometimes it's not really like you have to do it like 60 minutes continuously, but when you feel like when you're starting a walk, running on a treadmill, for instance, or just running in your garden, um, I've, uh, I've heard in the United States, the gardens are big, bigger, bigger than what we have here in the Netherlands. Um, if you have like five minutes of good walking, of good running, and you can keep it stable, but you feel like it's, going, it's a bit wobblier or you feel like it's, well, it doesn't feel okay, Give five minutes rest and repeat it again. Five minutes. Use intervals. It's fine. But keep the intervals interlinked. So it's not like that you should train five minutes, wait an hour, and then another five minutes. But try to keep it more closely together. Five minutes of running, five minutes rest, those kind of things. And also when you have a lot of uh, when you have your appropriate intensity, you should have a subjective intensity of about seven out of ten. So it has to feel that you did something. You should be also, I, I didn't put it in there, but you should feel proud of yourself. If you do that, then you have good intensity. But more importantly, it should be fun. Do something you like. This is the chance for you to do stuff that you normally wouldn't do. And there are a lot of online resources to do it. So just rehearsing, how about periodization is also important. Try to get it three times a week with a day in between with doing strength training. Take your time, don't rush it. And you should tra train at the physiological threshold. This is not time dependent. So for instance, I do a lot of strength training in the gym, well, normally I do, not at this point. Um, um, 30 minutes of strength training is more enough. So, and I completely blistered after 30 minutes of strength training. So you don't have to take hours for it. I'd rather have you take shorter with higher intensities than longer with lower intensities. And fun activity, as frequent as you like and can. Um, you should be more fun than more effective and try something different. And it should be 60 minutes with a sweat and a giggle. So um, also weight control is really important. 
So weight control is more crucial in isolation. So um, if you have problems with the weight or have a little bit uh, high body weight, uh, consult a nutritionist. Uh, remotely, of course. Um, just remember that you have less habitual activity, that you have also have different nutritional needs. So if you're less, uh, less active, you will probably have to have less food intake or other food intake. Um, and it's also always good to be advised by professional. It also goes for the training part. Um, you just consult your physical therapist as well. And again, healthy activity goes hand in hand with nutrition. So if you're going all out in training because you don't have anything better to do, you have to adapt your nutrition as well. Um, also, what we found in literature, um, that nutrition can also be a very good, um, can be vital for managing your symptoms. Um, there are some suggestions that a good nutrition will help you with your pain, especially with your fatigue, but that's still a little bit, uh, the judges are still out for that. And also the second part is your mental health. Um, especially in these times, especially, I can't imagine if people start losing friends, family to the COVID virus or other ways of just life. Um, you have mental health is an issue for everybody at this point, but especially if you're chronic disease, it's even more. So consult a psychologist when needed. This is our, one of those professions you can consult remotely. Um, you, you should do it. Don't be ashamed of it. Ask help if you need it. Physical fitness helps. So uh, we know that depression is actually pretty good monitored by a regular uh, physical activity. So it will help as well if you stay active. Um, and again, have fun. So take pleasure in positive moments and try to create them actively. So really have fun as much as you can. This should be a goal for you to have at least one fun time, fun thing a day, something you like to do. And set goals. So um, surviving in isolation is not a good goal, right? You should set a goal um, that helps you enhance your life now but also next when you're out of isolation life continues even when you're staying at home communicate can talk talk to your friends loved ones keep in touch with each other with the EDS society and patients that you know people that you love stay and talk and remember pain and fatigue are bad advisors right so there is a brain that will that doesn't uh, work differently um and you have to accept that you have less optimal day so i'm talking about try it three times a week Sometimes it's just not possible. And you should, yeah, accept that. And um, also remember that uh, you can control the progression of your disease, even to an extent, even in these times. And how you do that is well, staying active and staying healthy as much as you can. So here are my tips. Make a schedule a day. Uh, when you start training, monitor yourself. So look at your weight. Um, look at your stress levels. A lot of smartphones can measure stress levels, so they're not really accurate, but um, at least it gives you a little bit of sense. Uh, also, your uh, steps a day are really important. Try to keep, keep it at the 10,000 if possible, uh, or at least the level you had prior to uh, the COVID uh, spread. And also, failure training as much as family. So I'm not saying family is less important, but um, it's easy to focus on your loved ones instead of yourself. And sometimes you have to focus on your training time as well. Accept uh, less autumn days. Stay positive, right? Um, you got this far, so why can't you go any further? And seek help when needed. There are a lot of professionals, a lot of my colleague physical therapists are still available. Not as the way we want to, but we are available. So you, we can help from a distance sometimes, especially with advising for training. And also do to get it. So last part is the environment and environmental opportunities, right? So uh, everybody goes to a gym. I also find it really funny uh, that everybody, everybody wants to go to the Stairmaster. There are lines in the gym where, uh, where I train and you have Stairmaster at home. Use those stairs, use them, use them frequently. Use them part of your exercise routine. Who cares? Just do it. Also, your personal trainer, in my case, the one I'm married to, so I have a, a beautiful wife, um, and use each other to train, right? So she keeps me active, I keep her active. She tells me, okay, you have to ride a bike now, so do it. Uh, also, when you're doing physical activity, start training together. 
So it's perfectly fine that you do sit-ups or push-ups in the garden together. But also use your children. Use games with your children. If you start playing with your children, do it actively. So every minute you can get in there a day that keeps you active in a stable and safe way, use it. And also your training homies, people there, you put uh, things like Zoom on, start training together. Do it together, start making each other uh, aware of their activity, but also have fun together. Okay, well, um, this is my part. I'm open for some questions, but um, I hope it helps. Um, some of this is, uh, well, a little bit trying out yourself. Look for some help if you need it, but um, good luck, stay safe and enjoy. And thank you, and I hope for some questions now. Alrighty, thank you so much, Dr. Mark. That was a wonderful session. Um, we have a bunch of questions in, uh, but as a reminder, you can still type in any questions you may have for Mark in the question box, and we'll try to get to as many of them as we can. Um, our first question, um, if you would actually do me the honor of looking in the question box, is not quite in a language I am familiar with, and I uh, don't trust myself or Google Translate. Um, yeah. So if you could go ahead and you know do it in, I believe that's Dutch, and then yeah. just a little translation for our um, English speakers. Well, um, this is uh, actually, uh, I know this name, um, somebody from Netherlands, somebody I work with. And this question is, um, how did you, um, how did you know that it's for central sensitization, uh, that you were testing in children? So how did I know that it's the brain that is was highly sensitive, uh, and not something else? Um, so, um, I'll keep it short. This is, I think like a little bit more professional question. Um, but the thing is we did it with exclusion. So we looked at the pain thresholds, we looked at, is it low? We looked at the um, other relationships with the anxiety children have and adults have, and also do we have signs of bruising, those kind of things, what was all no. So basically what was left is that the pain was evoked by the brain and not by something in the peripheral sense. But there's also some data now from more central mediated uh, measures. So people were measuring actually in the brain and finding the same things we do. So this is my answer. Um, Alrighty. Okay, let's do the second one. Okay. Um, so are there any references for some of the theories for uh, differences between generalized joint hypermobility and issues for joint instability? Specifically that generalized joint hypermobility is not a problem until the demands exceed the body ability, such as in elite sports. Yeah, um, there, there is some literature on it. Uh, well, my paper in 2013 uh, about generalized joint hypermobility in professional dancers is one of them. Um, actually, I say there that it might be a, a, a downside of being hypermobile, uh, but you're doing athlete levels. And also my paper in 2017 in children, uh, also rheumatology, actually, um, we tried to factor in um, the Bayesian scores or the hypermobility and actually it didn't factor in anything. Um, so these are the reference basically. And the last reference, I think the most strongest one, this is the first longitudinal study conducted in Ilos Danos uh, children. Um, so these are one of the most things. And there are a couple of studies underway now. One of them is in review at this point. Uh, so when, uh, and actually that says that joint instability is a big problem uh, in comparison to hypermobility itself. So um, when that becomes public, I will uh, publish it uh, with the Elias Danos Society and also on internet. So you can follow me on Twitter and uh, everything I do, I'll place on Twitter, sometimes the annoy annoyance of people, uh, but you can find it there. So stay tuned, uh, but it's not like it's really, really, really scientifically proven. But then again, there are a lot of um, studies that find association with hypermobility, but none of them do hypermobility and joint instability. And we found that that's definitely a difference. Alrighty, thank you so much for that explanation. Um, the next question we have is, how do you practice self-management if every day is different from the other? Yeah, really good question. Um, what I find um, that, well, how do you practice self-management? First of all, is learn how your body works, right? Uh, you have pretty a lot of experience with your body and sometimes you can't trust it um, when the brain again, right? It's 
so you can't always trust it. But there are some things you can do. So um, self-management is not like keeping every day stable. It's also how you react to a different day. So for instance, when you wake up full of energy, right? Then a good strategy would be, okay, I feel good today. And so I'm going to try to do something extra. So I'm going to walk to the grocery store instead of um, using the car. Uh, again, I'm from the Netherlands. We have small countries, so everything is in walking distance. I've been to the United States. I know it's differently, uh, so it might not be a good example. Uh, but self-management is also um, recognizing that you have a bad day. And self-management is also about uh, not uh, giving up at that day. That don't, sometimes you have to accept, okay, I have a crappy day. This is it. Done. Tomorrow is the next day and I'll try better. Self-management is more than just um, making every day a winner. Self-management is also how to deal with it. And one of the things I hope you'll find helpful in self-management is how you train. And one of my best tips I can give is just maintain your stability. So juggle your health on a ball and a chubby. Very well said. <laughs> Um, our next question is, were autism spectrum disorders a factor in your inclusion and exclusion criteria? I'm asking because of the common comorbidity that is seen and the mention of sensory issues. Sorry, you, you, you dropped a little bit out. Uh, can you repeat the question again? Were autism spectrum disorders a factor in your inclusion and exclusion criteria? I'm asking autism. because of the common comorbidity between that and the mention of the sensory issues. Well, um, uh, in our study, uh, we had a normal uh, group of uh, children with autism and in adults as well. Um, the adult group didn't have any autism, actually, um, but uh, we didn't find any differences in, um, in sensory uh, recognition. So uh, what I did find even, I was a little bit afraid with children because children can be really um, less focused. Uh, or they can interpret it, things differently. And the way we tested was actually quite straightforward. So even the children that had autism or Asperger's uh, syndrome, um, and there are, not a, there are not a lot of them, so that's, to be honest, there are not a lot of them, they actually reacted the same. So um, again, I do recognize that your sensory modalities can be different when you have autism or Asperger's syndrome. Um, but these modalities are quite straightforward. So um, they tend to react the same. And so I think they have the same sensitive brain as others. But still, it is a little bit of a different category. Um, and um, so it might be a bit different. But uh, what I've seen, it is not. All right. Thank you so much. Um, do you have any advice on how community members... Uh, do you have any advice on how community members can do things like facial release at home since they are not always able to get in to see their physio now? Yeah. Um, I'm not an expert on facial uh, techniques. Um, so I don't know lo a lot about it. Um, yeah. And uh, what I do know about it, it's, it's quite manual. So I think facial techniques are probably one of the difficult things you can do at home. Um, so I would rather suggest you contact your physical therapist uh, that uses those techniques and try to figure something out. Um, I can't think about something you can do now, but um, I would suggest, um, and I'm not an expert, um, activity is a proven way to reduce your symptoms and disability. Facial techniques, they have some promising, but there's not a lot of data on it. Um, so if you experience yourself a lot of um, yeah, uh, advantages of those techniques, um, consult your physical therapist and try to figure something out. Um, they're probably, if you have like really creative physical therapist, you might you know, MacGyver something, but uh, I can't think of something at this point right now. I only can think of trying to stay active. Alrighty, thank you so much. Um, would the lower pain threshold not be due to constant pain triggers? Um, that's a good question, and we wondered uh, ourselves that uh, as well. Um, and this is a little bit 
tricky. So what is the chicken and the egg question, right? Um, so does your central nervous system become sensitive because you have constantly pain? Or does your central nervous system um, uh, start uh, actually is the cause of the pain? And I think the, the answer is a little bit in between. There are studies that actually found that the wind-up ratio of the central nervous system is quite fast. So the brain reacts faster to pain thresholds, to pain in general. Um, also, there are a lot of studies, uh, well, not a lot, there are a couple of studies that actually found that uh, when somebody is giving a visual image of pain or something that is, uh, creates a little bit anxiety, uh, that you react sooner. So um, the constant pain can trigger a sensitive nervous system, but there are still more uh, signs that the, the, the central nervous system has a big role in the pain itself. So um, I can't really answer that question because the data is not there. But we have one study now that actually found that if you have a sensitive central nervous system, your pain starts uh, accumulating almost in a, a well, in a re really, really fast uh, over three years. So um, when we uh, looked at how many painful joints these individuals had, mm -hmm. there was no relationship between the amount of pain sensitivity and the number of painful joints. So something is making the pain worse and something is making the brain sensitive. What is actually, actually what we don't know um, but I do know, and this is one of the things why I'm really passionate about, is that you're not imagining stuff. You have a brain that makes your pain real. And you're not hysterical. Uh, you're not imagining stuff. You have pain. But the pain can be triggered by things normal people wouldn't have pain in that instance. It can be due to instability, but also just because your brain is more sensitive. So I think that's the more important question I have. Uh, but if you're asking what is the cause of those problems, well, maybe in 10 years, I know. I'll, I'll, I'll let you know when I find out. Alrighty, thank you so much. And thank you for those words and supporting our community because so often our community members are told that the pain's all in their head and it's not there. So hearing that from medical professionals really does support our well, community. Maybe a little bit of word uh, next to it. Next to it. Um, again, it is more complex. So it is not like the pain originates solely from the brain. It is although that the pain is solely imaginary. It is, it is something in between and it shifts all the time. So um, just remember that because you experience pain, it is real. The oranges of the pain can be psychological, can be neurological, and probably is a combination of both. And personally, I tell my students, and this is a true story, uh, if I ever catch them saying the phrase, sorry, your pain is between your ears, I rip the diploma in two because your brain is between your ears. So it's always between your ears. Well said. Um, we've got a couple more questions left if you're uh, able to stay on a little bit longer with us. Yeah, fine. Okay, um, the next one is how common was pelvic pain and or hypertonic pelvic floor dysfunction in your studies? I completely don't know. We didn't look at it. All righty, cool. Thank you so much. Um, do you have any advice to help prevent micro traumas? Yeah, um, the one I gave, um, try to exercise with stability. Um, Controlling the movement may be more important than, um, than how frequently you do the movement. So um, focus on when doing strength training, focus on how fluent the movement is and how well you can control it. Uh, I don't know if there's, there is not really evidence that there's actual micro trauma in joints or there is some data on it, um, but it's not really clear. But what we do know is when um, joints become unstable, the number of uh, painful joints increases, which is not really rocket science, uh, but also pain intensity increases. So um, I don't know about micro fractures, but I do know that if you can limit instability as much as you can, it will help you in the long term. 
All righty, thank All you right. so much. And I'm gonna combine these last two questions because they're very similar and I've seen concerns similar to this in the chat as well. Um, we've got attendees that are concerned about injuries and subluxing and dislocating yeah. and not having the option to go to an emergency room or an A&E or anything. Yeah. Um, so what can they do to minimize joint subluxations? What can they do to avoid injuries? Um, well, just to, to be the safest they can during these times. Yeah. I, I think the last phrase is, is the most important one, be as safe as you can. Um, you can't always prevent the luxation. Um, again, the brain is also really a big factor in that. Uh, so sometimes uh, a joint is not uh, old. There's a real luxation. Sometimes people have uh, pain uh, that they associate the luxation, but when they look at the x-ray, they can't find it. Um, doesn't mean it's still there, it still is there. Um, but if you're really worried about it, um, try starting low, right? So try starting at a position that is stable as possibly can. So sometimes if you want to train, strain your hip extensors, for instance, uh, lie down on your back and just try to raise them uh, one, one feet at a time or um, just try to lift your pelvis up uh, or just move as, as slow as you can. So for instance, um, what I found, uh, what I talked to a lot of patients and they found actually things like uh, yoga or Pilates uh, was really good. And one of the things Pilates and yoga, uh, a good yoga teacher do, he teaches you the movement first in small steps and then makes it more difficult. So um, if you're worried about luxations, what I can really imagine, um, start really simple with maximum stability as you can um, and also uh, train together, right? So when you using, doing squats, you are able to do a squat with a body weight, um, then um, ask your partner, tell friend, okay, give me a sign when I'm doing weird stuff uh, or um, videotape yourself, put you on the screen, look at it, look at the mirror, um, try to see what you're doing and try to keep it stable much as you can and if you are a little bit fearsome start low start really easy with exercise that don't require a lot of stability and take small steps at a time so again i was talking about um, under training is a problem um, but also um, if you're starting exercises and you're scared uh, it's probably not gonna, doesn't work for you as well. So make it as safe as you can with starting low level, not a lot of range of motion, small steps, and increase it on the way uh, when you feel comfortable with it. All righty, thank you so much for that uh, advice. But um, I think we're gonna wrap it up here uh, because that's about all the time we have. If you would yeah. like any more information about anything that was presented today, please check out our website for more resources and information. Also feel free to give our helpline a call or an email and definitely consider signing up for our newsletter if you haven't already. It's a fantastic source for the most up-to-date information and upcoming events, including our webinars. Speaking of, our next webinar will be another movement-centered webinar on Wednesday, April 15th at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. Come out and join us as Dr. Marcia Pareto introduces her physical therapy program, Actify PT, and explains how it is built to help individuals with EDS, HSD, and hypermobility. You can look out for the sign up on our website and our various social media platforms. Uh, thank you once again, Mark. Um, this is definitely uncharted mm -hmm. territory that we're all trying to work through. And um, I think I speak for our community when I say thank you so much for jumping in to help and support us during this yeah, time. The, the community has helped me a lot, so it's the least I can do. So everybody stay safe and um, have a little bit of fun. Right. Yep. And um, technology permitting, this webinar should be up on YouTube um, on our channel within the next week or so. Um, so if you found this webinar helpful in any way, please consider hitting that like button once it's posted um, and subscribe to our channel so you can be alerted to when we're uploading our newest videos. Um, as Mark said, I hope everybody that joined us today has a wonderful rest of your day or your evening and stays as safe and healthy as possible. Take care, everyone.